series of lessons on Pentecostal doctrine and just some of the basics. Tonight, we are going to talk about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We've never been taught about that. Tonight is the night. We have so far talked about the need for doctrine, why we would have doctrine. Uh, we've talked about the inspired Word of God. We've talked about the Godhead or the Trinity. We've talked about Christ and His humanity and divinity. And we've talked about salvation, water baptism, and communion. Yes, that's what we talked about last week. So tonight we're going to talk about what does it mean to be spirit-filled or a Christian to be spirit-filled. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a distinctly Pentecostal doctrine. Some other churches believe in it, but it is distinctly Pentecostal. For instance, I don't know if you know that or not, but the Anglican Church in the United States, they believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Most of the U.S. churches don't do so, but almost all of the African Anglican churches speak in tongues. Same thing in Korea. And I know that not because I've done research, but because we had an assistant here for several years, you probably remember Moses, and he told me it doesn't matter if it said Presbyterian or if it said Baptist or whatever, in Korea, they all believe in and practice speaking in tongues. In Korea, it is still the world's largest Pentecostal church, thousands upon thousands, uh, just in that one church. Our church, what does our church believe? Our church believes that the experience of those in the early church, in other words, the disciples in the early few centuries, first couple of centuries, uh, that their experience is still valid. So in other words, I could say it in the opposite way. We do not believe in cessation. We believe that the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, as well as the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still uh, in action used and usable in the church. So uh, we still believe that. And that we have access to the same infilling that the apostles had and that infilling empowered them uh, to do what they did. The cessationists believe that it was only for the apostles and that the work of the Holy Spirit has ceased. But we don't believe that. There are some misunderstandings about the baptism of the Holy Spirit by other denominations, other people. And I don't say this to belittle them. I'm just telling you that there are uh, other philosophies and things out there. Some accuse us as Pentecostals of seeing ourselves as superior or more spiritually advanced than others. And uh, that really should not be true and hopefully is not true. We know that we all need the Lord. We all need the Holy Spirit. Amen? Uh, so we're not better than anybody else just because we're filled with the Holy Spirit and have gifts of the Holy Spirit and all that. We're all desperately still in need of the Savior, desperately in need of the Holy Spirit alive in our lives. So some say that we believe that you have to have be baptized in the Holy Spirit in order to be saved. We do not believe that. There is a separate work of salvation, as we'll talk about, uh, and we have talked about. It does involve the Holy Spirit. So, why does the Pentecostal perspective on this doctrine of baptism of the Holy Spirit, why do we believe it's so important? Emphasize it, we talk about it, we teach it, we practice it, even in combined services, all those kinds of things, why do we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because it helps us accomplish God's purpose. That's the most important thing. 
You see, I, I say it many times when I'm preaching or teaching, but it, it's not about the feeling that you get when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, though that is a great feeling. I mean, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you speak in tongues or you the Holy Spirit manifests itself in, a, you know, when you, in your life, it's great. It's awesome. The main purpose of the Holy Spirit is to help you to accomplish God's purpose, both in your life as well as the grand purpose of God. What is the grand purpose of God? People be saved. Right? It is the Great Commission. So it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us. Does the Holy Spirit sometimes uh, manifest and people may shake, people may uh, shout, people may run? I've, I've been in Pentecost for a long time, so I've, I've seen all of that. Uh, I've seen people, uh, you know, do different things. I've seen some scream. I usually know who those are, so I'm prepared. But anyway, <laughs> the purpose, I, I want you to get this. You don't get anything else tonight. The purpose is not to say that we're better than anybody else because we have the Holy Spirit, but that we are empowered. It is a gift from God to us to help us fulfill the Great Commission. In this study, we've been talking about cardinal doctrines and all kinds of things. The first cardinal doctrine is the doctrine of salvation. The second cardinal doctrine, from a Pentecostal perspective, is baptism in the Holy Spirit. It is a distinctive. In other words, it sets us apart from other Protestant churches and communities. So this is different. That's why we may get odd looks. It may be why they would call us things like, you know, holy rollers or something like that. Uh, not everybody does. Some people believe in, in it, but don't practice it in a congregational setting. Some people, you know, uh, do, do fully believe in it, but don't, don't practice it. So, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a biblical experience that is available to all Christians today. That's what we believe. It's available to anybody that is a Christian. Just like our doctrine on partaking in communion and our doctrine in being baptized, the first requirement is that we be saved, right? Uh, in order to be a part of that. And that is uh, the same thing for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So all believers are entitled to and should expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father. So if you're saved and you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't be. And uh, if you desire to be, uh, it's not a magic formula either. That's the good news. You don't have to say this one word real fast and another word slow. There's no formula to it. I can tell you how I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I've also heard people being baptized in the Holy Spirit in their home, in their closet. In their bed, right? One of the wildest things that I ever saw is we had a couple, and they were here for years. Brother and Sister Baker, some of you may have known them, some may not. They came to a revival. They came forward, got saved, and immediately were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. There's no time frame with the exception of that it is subsequent, that just means after being saved, right? So that's important for us to, to know. Uh, the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire is sometimes how we talk about it. And that is actually, was a command of the Lord for his disciples, that they be filled. But where did, where did I get that? When Jesus ascended, before he ascended, he said, go and carry in Jerusalem, and there you'll be empowered, right, by the Holy Spirit. So that's a direct command. If he told those disciples, I believe he's telling us. Now, does that mean that you're inferior if you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit? No. Uh, but it does mean that 
it's available for you, right? I think that's a good thing, amen, uh, for, for everybody. The experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost was normal in the early Christian church. Very normal. Uh, in the first and second centuries, all the way up to the fourth century, a very, very normal experience to be saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was normal. I honestly, I think that we should expect miracles, signs, and wonders in our lives. I, I think it, it really for the Christian ought to be commonplace. Again, it doesn't mean we're inferior if we're not, but the potential for that to happen is there. I've experienced a miracle in my own body. I've watched other people experience miracles. Uh, I've seen God do things that's only explainable that God did. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and some of you may have seen those as well. So uh, it was commonplace for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When, it, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's a whole lot here, okay? So the Holy Spirit comes upon you to endue you with power, power to live your life as a Christian. That's the first thing I want to say. God is concerned about how you live your life. So much so that he gave the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit to help you live, pay attention to my word, a successful Christian life. Success in the kingdom is different than success in the world. So I'm not talking about having money and cars and, and houses and all. I'm, I'm talking about what does God care about? Well, number one, he cares about people being saved. Jesus came uh, that people would be saved. That all, that all would be saved, actually, is what it says. Yeah. We also see that when Jesus ministered upon the earth and Many miracles and different signs and wonders took place, and we know that the Holy Spirit was a part of his ministry. When he gets baptized in the water, there's an initiation there of his ministry, and the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and the Father says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, who are we to think that we don't, right? And, and I believe we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, I said this already, is distinct from and subsequent to a new birth. What do I mean by that? When you get saved, the Holy Spirit is doing a work in your life. As a matter of fact, let's just set a scene. Maybe the pastor's up preaching. He's preaching the gospel. There's someone in the congregation that the Holy Spirit is at work and he's causing the words of the pastor to come alive. Uh, and, and, and it has to happen to me because I don't preach or teach that well. So I need the Holy Spirit, right? And whenever he comes and, and that word sits upon that person, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it, begins to generate in that person's life, right? And suddenly there is what we call Conviction. Conviction. I'm thankful for conviction. Amen? And conviction doesn't just come for the sinner. It comes for the saints as well, right? I'm glad that the Holy Spirit, and, and we want to make sure that we give the Holy Spirit full reign in our lives. So the Holy Spirit comes to help us in our lives. And to help us serve the Lord. Right? If you're like me, you may not feel qualified. You may feel like you need some work, like all of us tend to feel. But it is actually the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And I, talk, I preached about this Sunday. When I'm weak, he's strong. Right? Uh, 
Uh, so it's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit not only to live my life, but to serve Him and to serve others. I'm, I'm getting to this uh, understanding of that I need the Holy Spirit for everything. I saw on the Facebook one, I need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. Walmart. Well, certainly you do, because there's some weird people in Walmart if you've uh, seen them. Anyway, I, I digress. Not only power for your life, but power to serve, but the bestowing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit when we work in the ministry. We'll talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a minute, but I want to put that out there, that when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, those gifts are available to you. Okay? Baptism of the Holy Spirit is uh, distinct. It is not the same thing as being saved. Although the Holy Spirit is involved in salvation, the Holy Spirit brings us into the body of Christ when we're saved. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a different experience. Uh, when we experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we may feel different. Did you feel different when you got saved? Absolutely. You will feel different when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. There'll be a fullness of your spirit. And I, I don't know how to describe that, but it's just you just feel different, okay? Uh, and you, you just know, right? It's a witness. There's a witness for salvation, but there's also a witness when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and you feel different and you know that you've been empowered to do these things for the Lord. You may see things like a deepened reverence for God, uh, maybe a greater consecration to God, more of a dedication to his work, and certainly you will experience an even greater love for God. For sure. There's just something about and people. Yeah. Oh my. We need the Holy Spirit to help us love people, don't we? Woo! But some people, man, I really gotta have the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? But but it does. It helps us love people better. And I think sometimes also that when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit that we may also gain a greater love and affection for his work. So those are just some of the things that we could experience. Again, baptism is available to all Christians. It's something that we should seek as long as we have accepted Christ as our Savior. What do you do to earn a gift? Nothing. I want to emphasize that. We just thank you. We just thank you, right? Thank you. I appreciate that. You didn't have to do it, but I appreciate that you did it, right? That's how we accept gifts. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same way. Don't have to work for it. Don't have to receive it just like everybody else did. But it's for us. When I was nine, I got saved at seven, baptized in the Holy Spirit at age nine in a kid's youth camp. It didn't feel like a kid's youth camp. Can I tell you that? But man, the power of the Holy Spirit was there. Kids were speaking in tongues and falling out and praying for one another. Goosebumps when I talk about it. And, and, and the adults were there with us and they were showing us. By the way, we, we sometimes miss that. There is a reason why this pastor's heart is for the kids that experience worship. I know they need a, a, a service in their own age group, but I also want to tell you that it's powerful when they experience worship in the whole corporate setting. So my heart is sometimes that we're going to do that, right? It's important. And everybody else is getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I don't want to get left out. So guess what I did? I went down to the altar. I just began to pray. I had no idea. I had not had a class in theology. Zero. None. I didn't know near as much then as I do now. Thank God. 
Because sometimes what we know can get in the way of our ability to receive what God's already given to us. Sometimes we feel like we have to dot every I and cross every T in order to get just in the right spot that God would give us something that he's already promised to us. Kind of like the Hebrew children that were supposed to go into the promised land. Moses sends them in there to spy to find out not if, if they can take the land, but what it's going to be like when they do take it and how blessed the land is. Right? I had my pastor on one side of me praying for me and a pastor out of Frankfurt, Gene Roberts, some of you know him, praying for me on the other side. They weren't doing crazy things like sometimes you see. I've been in some services where they're saying, say this real loud, or don't say anything, or move like this. Or do, they weren't doing any of that. You know what they were saying? It's a gift. Ask God for it. Be willing to let him use your tongue. See, baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about surrender. Yes. All about surrender. I find it amazing that the very thing that the scripture says is uncontrollable, that we cannot control it. It's like trying to tame a lion or something like that. We can do that, but we can't control our tongue. But when we yield that to the Holy Spirit, what he does lesson in that, that we, we yield it. Jesus promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit to his disciples prior to him being crucified, his death and resurrection. And the Lord told them that it would be an instrument for them that would help them further his work on the earth. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not about you. It's about God's work, right? Uh, it, it's about being empowered and equipped to do what God's called you to do, right? So uh, many times when, when we talk, especially to people who haven't experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit or, 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 or very foreign to it, maybe uh, some have heard and maybe not that foreign to it, but until you experience it. It is an experience, by the way. It's an experience. I can't tell you exactly what it's like. But I can tell you when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I can tell you. Those pastors were praying for me, and they were just telling me things like, just worship Jesus. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, by the way. He's the one that sent it. He said, i got to ascend so that I can send the Holy Spirit. So when we, we don't really seek the Holy Spirit, because Jesus already sent it, we don't have to seek it. We just begin to worship the Lord and begin to honor him and praise him. And then along comes the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to describe this, but he just, when you feel that, and, and there's just, we're not, we're not going to talk about speaking in tongues tonight. I, I want to go there, but we're not going to, okay? <laughs> uh, but it's a different feeling, okay? The first group to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the disciples. So the Bible says that what looked like tongues of fire appeared above every person. Like tongues of fire. Not actual tongues of fire, but it looked like it. It also says that there was a sound of an abundance of wind, right? A great, mighty wind. It doesn't say there was a wind. It says it's a sound. Those are both symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And wind, which is the Greek word pneuma, and then the fire. By the way, the Holy Spirit symbolized by fire. It's also very powerful, all consuming. Yes. So uh, here is that uh, what happens? They're filled with the Spirit, and all of them spoke in languages that they did not know, which is what we call speaking in tongues. They were human languages that they had never learned.
they didn't have that 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 uh, babble, babble or that biblical translate. They did. They didn't have any of that. They began to speak fluently in a language that they didn't know. That's powerful. Guess what they were speaking? You ever wonder what you're speaking when you speak in tongues? Now, speaking in tongues as far as interpretation may be different. But when you're speaking in tongues and you're worshiping the Lord, you're worshiping him in tongues as well. Because the disciples and the, the people that were there said, we hear about the mighty works of God in these people. Right? While the whole baptism in the Holy Spirit is different, it's a unique experience, it's also a part of worship. Right? And so it's not so odd if it's just a part and a process, parcel of worship uh, when we speak in tongues. I'll just say this. You should never speak in tongues or never say that you have the baptism in the Holy Spirit as a status symbol. Right? No, that's not necessary. You should not uh, do that. A genuine desire to serve God, to serve others, and a motivation to receive the gift should be the only thing that is a motivation. Right? Not to brag. So the Holy Spirit empowers us to reach the lost, to live a holy life. We haven't talked about that. Have you ever had been going to do something, or you said something out of the way, or uh, you were going to something, and the Holy Spirit said, "Don't go, don't do that, don't say that, you shouldn't do that." Because if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you like that, He will. I promise you. I've been on my way to go somewhere before and turn around and went home. And it wasn't even a bad place to go. But I felt the Holy Spirit say, don't go. It's not the time to go. I've also said things that I should have said and had to repent. Because that's what the Holy Spirit will lead you to do. So when that person, I'll not just use you, okay? When that person uh, <laughs> cuts you off in traffic, and, and, and you know, you bad mouth them, and then the Holy Spirit comes along and sit down now. Come on. Right? Well, the Holy Spirit will help you to live a holy life. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a very practical thing that will help you serve other people. So that's the purpose of baptism. If we use it to act in any other way, it's a waste, hear me, of the power of God. So if we just get the Holy Spirit in order that we can speak real loud in tongues in a church service and people will notice us, then we have the wrong motivation. Matter of fact, I don't think the Lord will give it to you. If that was your sole motivation, right? The baptism in the Holy Spirit should not be confused with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit takes place at the time of salvation. So when you repent of your sins and ask the Lord to come into your life and be Lord and Savior, by the way, we ought to ask for both, because you don't just need a Savior, you need a Lord, right? Uh, and so when you repent, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and he takes up residence, he dwells, indwelling for you. Every believer has the Holy Spirit living in Every believer. The Holy Spirit bears witness of the presence of God in your life. The Holy Spirit is there to act as a comforter. Have you ever had the Holy Spirit comfort you? Yeah. But sometimes life's rough and tough and not fun. And the Holy Spirit comes along and just speaks peace into your life. Tells you things. Let you know that you've not been abandoned. You ever felt like you were abandoned? The Lord, where's the Lord? Why am I going through this? Why, why are my kids going through this? Right? And the Holy Spirit comes along to comfort you, to give you peace that passes all understanding. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. 
and the Holy Spirit provides the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is different than the gifts of the Spirit. Right? The fruit of the Spirit is more practical for your daily life. Okay? So, somebody name for me some of the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all those kinds of things, right? Those are for you to live a regular life and interact with people of the Holy Spirit. So, you're not so mean and ornery that they want to come to Jesus. Wow, I did say that. Uh, it's true, though, isn't it? We should be different than the world. I've seen people that had gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they were mean as a rattlesnake. They needed the fruit of the Holy Spirit. All of these things, and I, tonight I'm just emphasizing the importance of baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that you have the Holy Spirit in you when you're saved. This is a different, distinct experience. No one, nowhere in the Bible do we see a person who is baptized in the Holy Spirit apart from salvation. It's all, uh, salvation is always uh, present prior to baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, sometimes it's immediate, sometimes a considerable time later. This is not Pentecostal Church of God doctrine. This is me simply saying this because I think I've seen it in people's lives, okay? I believe that I've seen the Holy Spirit manifested in a person's life who never spoke in tongues. It's not, I, that's not in the Bible anywhere. We don't see that, but I have seen people that sure, can I, there's a witness of the Holy Spirit the gifts and people who did not speak in tongues. So I went to the Methodist church out here, like Pastor Tim was the pastor there. They had a special conference. It was a healing conference. For me, it was a unique service because Pentecostals, I'm just like telling this, okay? Pentecostals have a tendency to get real loud and to do things somewhat boisterously uh, and I went there and God opened my eyes because they would simply call people up and pray for them not ever get real loud. I, I couldn't hardly hear them from where I was at. I was expecting, you know, just a hand and boom, they're out. You know, because sometimes we see that in Pentecost and they fall out in the spirit. But there was no denying that that person got healed because some of them had terrible limps and arms that were messed up and all kinds of things and they said, I'm, I'm better. I'm healed. So, what am I saying? Sometimes the Holy Spirit can manifest itself in different ways. I do believe that the Holy Spirit will witness to you if you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Again, that doesn't make anybody who is baptized in the Holy Spirit better than someone who isn't. Matter of fact, you know, sometimes we can be prideful if we don't watch out, right? So we have to uh, make sure we know that. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit provides additional tools for us to do the work of God. Some of those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I said we'll get to these. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit are speaking in tongues. Have you ever heard somebody speak in tongues? Right? Uh, and again, we're going to talk about that next week, but sometimes it's a prayer life, sometimes it's speaking in tongues to be interpreted, sometimes the Holy Spirit will, I, I hate to use the word manifest, but that's what it is in different ways. So speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, interpretation of tongues, the, and these are gifts, by the way. Let me ask you a loaded question. What is the best gift? The one that's needed at the time. Right? Now this is teaching. Can I 
this is teaching that my pastor taught me, Brother Tim. Says, can I tell you that there's a gift of prophecy when somebody needs a healing? It doesn't make a difference. Doesn't help, right? It, it, that person needs the, maybe the gift of miracles or the uh, workings of miracles as you hear. So the best gift is the gift that is needed at the time, right? If you need a word of knowledge, you might not need the gift of faith at the time. Word of wisdom. What do those look like? Word of knowledge and word of wisdom look a whole lot alike. When you see them in action. They really do. Word of knowledge typically does not follow a tongue. It typically is just impressed upon a person in the congregation when the Holy Spirit is moving, maybe an intense time of worship or whatever, or whatever uh, and that person will bring a word of knowledge or wisdom to the congregation to say, this is what I feel like God is saying in this moment for us and for this church and, or maybe even a word of wisdom or knowledge for a single person. They're not typically, I've never seen a tongue and then a word of knowledge. I've seen a tongue and interpretation, but I've seen a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom come without tongue. Working of miracles. What's the difference between a miracle and a healing? Miracles are instantaneous. Healing is rapid, right? A miracle, by definition, circumvents nature. Can I tell you, I experienced a miracle in my life with my hip, foot, the length of my foot. So it's documented by many of us, specifically lately by the chiropractor that I go to. So he can tell you my length of my left leg was an inch and an eighth at best, sometimes more than that, shorter than my right leg. And I was asking the Lord for a miracle, not gradually. And that's what happened. Because they didn't even text me to pray for me. And I said, God, why don't you just do this without anybody getting involved? And, and I really, my, I, don't, I don't want to sound super spiritual here because I'm saying in my mind, I just want you to get all the glory. You know, I, I don't care if you're an evangelist or the people praying for me, get any glory because this is about you. You chose me, you're going to do this, God, you just go ahead and do it. And He did. I sat there, and all of a sudden I feel like. Nobody touching me. My hip shift and some movement. I'm sitting there going, did anybody else see that? Because I certainly felt it. Then I went to the chiropractor and, oh, I called him up. I'm floored. I'm a Christian doctor. And I said, I've got a Pentecostal background. I just want you to verify what I believe is really real. Okay? And he did. So that's the difference between a miracle and a healing. Gift of discernment. Discernment of spirits, sometimes it's called. What does that look like? Discernment of spirits. Knowing what it's got and what it's not. That's a very uh, good basic definition of that. So discernment of spirits. Uh, I believe within that, Yes, the Holy Spirit will show you if it's a work of God or not. It could be a work of the devil. But also, and I link this in with discernment, is that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you intentions of people. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced it or not, but have you ever had somebody treat you real nice and lovey dovey and just they want to help you? And then you find out later, they were not for your good. They were about not helping, but actually being an agent to take you down. Right? The Holy Spirit will reveal intentions of people as well. 
I believe that that's an incorrect book of this sermon. Gift of faith. What does that look like? All of us have to have faith, right? You got to have faith to even be saved. Well, this is a supernatural gift of faith that you can operate in. Typically, people don't operate in all of these gifts. But at the time you need it, you can operate in it. So the gift of faith, the most important faith you can ever have is faith to be saved. Strict definition, that is not the gift of faith. Although God gave it to you, okay? So that you'd be saved. The gift of faith is to believe for the supernatural to occur. Is salvation supernatural? Yes, it is. But I believe that this is taking into account believing for some of these other things. Miracles, signs, wonders, all those kinds of things, okay? I'm not discounting the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation at all when I say that. Okay? Uh, but the gift of faith to believe God for the supernatural. Because many times these gifts of the Holy Spirit are working in conjunction with one another. Some of these are not defined fully. But there's the gift of faith. Some of these gifts are a little hard to describe how they work. I speak in tongues a lot, but in my prayer life. I rarely interpret, though I have been used to do that. I have given a word of wisdom. Matter of fact, the first time I did it, I was very confused because I was very young and I was like asking my pastors, like, there was no tongues. But yet the, the Lord impressed that upon me and you said, thank you for speaking what the Lord gave to you. So I didn't understand what a word of wisdom and knowledge was. Sometimes we just know we've got to believe the Lord God has told us. Prophecy. Can I tell you there's more gifts of the Holy Spirit in these that are listed in Ephesians? Uh, but this is the ones we typically talk about. Okay? So prophecy. What you need to know is prophecy is not always foretelling something to come to pass. Looking in the Old Testament, prophecy was gift and the office of prophet was to call people, God's people, back to him. Okay, that's the office of the prophet. But prophecy oftentimes was again exercised with other gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. You've heard this, but I, it's the best one I have for this. I'm praying for Mickey and Chris. They came forward. I knew that she had Lost their day, okay? Didn't carry them full time. And I knew this, and so when they came to me and they said, pray for us, that would happen. Okay. That's, I think, a baby is a blessing, right? You're not asking for something that, in my opinion, out of God's will or his plan or design. So I began to pray for them, asking God to give them offspring, to give them a, a child. To uh, you know, using some Old Testament language, prayed that they would he would bless the fruit of the womb, you know, all of those kinds of things. And I'm just praying the best I know how, because I'm honestly this is the first time anybody's ever asked me to pray this. Okay, so they come forward and I'm praying for them. And being, I hate to say this, but somewhat generic because because I, I don't know, I've not been asked to pray this way. And the Holy Spirit, while I'm praying, says. Tell them to go buy something for the baby. That terrified me, to be honest with you. Because I didn't want to say that and then, then get pregnant and lose another baby. Okay? Or never get pregnant and never have a child. Let's just be real. You ever have the Lord tell you to do something and you kind of just skirt around it? And you don't want to be obedient? If you're not saying that you've never had that happen, then you're probably lying. Uh, <laughs> I just, I'll just tell you because uh, most of us are not immediately obedient every time God asks us to do something it's just, it, it, we're being real with God so I just kept praying I knew it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me I just kept praying and 
And I was about to finish up, and the Lord said, I said, tell them to get something for the baby. In my spirit, I don't hear an audible voice, but I know God's speaking to me. Because the first time, it could have just been me. You know how we think, right? That could just be me, God. Second time, I knew. And so I stopped mid-sentence. I said, I just, I just have to be obedient to the Lord. And he stopped just a little bit. Like, I don't know what he's about to say. But I said, I believe the Lord is telling you to go get something for this baby. And it will be, here his word, a statement of faith for you. Just go ahead and get something for this baby. And they did conceive and they did have a child. So those are gifts of the Holy Spirit in action. So that's why we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Uh, and, and they're useful for the kingdom. They edify the kingdom of God. And we have to use those gifts for humility, knowing that it's God working through us to do His will. His plan to be done. So, I'll finish with this. Then we'll read Acts 1, 4 through 8. Because I think we need to read some scripture. Although I get all kinds of scriptures in bringing this to pass, but turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. This is not Acts chapter 2, where they are filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus telling them about being baptized. So, let's read it. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And being assembled together with them, he's with them, he's on a mountain, commands them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? I don't have time to go there, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit has a lot to do with the kingdom. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It's a gift. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, ask God for it. It does not have to come by laying on of hands. Though there is evidence that sometimes that is what happened in the New Testament. And then simply expect and you're good. So there's an asking and a believing or expecting. What do we see from Acts chapter 1? Wait for the promise. If you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, keep asking, keep waiting. God will give it to you if you ask. I've known some people who who it was years after salvation, years, decades, some, before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Second thing, baptism in the Holy Spirit was compared to water baptism because there's a holy immersion that takes place in both. Okay? So fully, total surrender when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And last of all, the power that you get when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit comes with a purpose. It's power with a purpose. Okay? Let's go through the questions. Question one. Pentecostals believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is still valid. People of Pentecostal perspective. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is important because it helps Christians accomplish God's purpose. Who is qualified to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? All that are saved. Every believer. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is distinct 
from and subsequent to the new birth. So it's different. Okay? On the day of Pentecost, what appeared above every person who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It was like tongues of fire. Who has the Holy Spirit living inside them? Every believer. Name the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let me let me just rattle them off here real quick. We might have them worded a little bit differently, but speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, working of miracles, gifts of healings, gift of discernment, gift of faith, prophecy. The gifts of the Holy Spirit that are present there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are other ones listed in some other places. What should you do if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit? That's order and perfection. 